policy things that have taken place, laws and policies have been put in place, they now really need to be implemented. So it's about action, action, action. There is no excuse to, to yet formulate another policy or yet another law. Now we need to really focus on concrete action and enforce it. Second one is that we need to sort of um, look at the many innovative things that are being done here and there and everywhere and bring them together and to a bigger scale. They need to reach to more people. It's not good to do a very solid innovation in one corner. Now we, need, we don't have time. We need to try to understand what makes it good and how we can expand it so that it reaches a larger uh, number of people. We very importantly, and I will just do this quickly, we need to reach out to civil society, to NGOs, to civil society groups, and work always, always with them, and in particular with young people. Young people have a lot of good ideas. They need to be listened to, and they need to tell how things, they would want things to be done in these matters. Then we can also provide our expertise, but we cannot tell young people what to do. It has to be, come from within, basically. Uh, and, of course, we need to make sure that there are budget lines, you know, not only speeches, although speeches are important to mobilize support, but at the end of the day, we need the money to go. First of all, the national money from the countries themselves, from their national budgets, from their community budgets, from the people themselves, because most of this actually is paid by out-of-pocket, you know, users and, and people, individuals pay most of the money. But also, importantly, by sustained um, international development assistance. So I would like to end by stressing that each one of you and all of us here, we can do something to bring our world into a greater balance in line with the vision that the leaders agreed 15 years ago. You can really do a lot. For starters, we can do what we're doing today. You can uh, share correct information on, about the connections between population and gender and how improving women's health and rights can create a more just, more secure, and more sustainable world everywhere. Here, in my country, in your country, everywhere. And you can also be partners in, in that way, actually, in mobilizing support for this in terms of um, whether it's in funding, in technical terms, whatever it is. And make sure that we get more and more people mobilized for these causes. And essentially, what we need to do, and you can do, is to challenge the pessimists. Pessimism is a very easy way of getting out of doing anything. So, I would urge all of us to challenge the pessimists who say nothing can be done and stand rather on the side of those who are already doing a lot, whether it is to improve their own lives, but also very often to reach out and improve the lives of others. So we can and you can be part of a generation and a movement that help to finally put an end to violence and discrimination against girls and women. We have the opportunity. We know what needs to be done. It's in our hands. So by standing up against this injustice, you will create a better world for everybody. So I end here. I thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry if I was a little long. It's, it's always a challenge, not knowing how much you, know, you can say and how much we keep for later. Uh, but as you can see, these are extremely important issues, and I really thank you for your attention, and I look forward to, to win this uh, presentation and challenge and then um, to the discussion that will follow. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Mari. And I'm sorry I missed the start of your um, lecture, but happily I had your slides already. <laughs> so thank you very much. And we'll go straight on um, to Wendy Harcourt. You have a long um, history of writing on development and gender and development. Uh, you have written the quarterly for the Society of International Development. You've been chair of uh, the Women in the Microphone. 
Can you not hear me? Better? Better? I have to eat it. Um, you have a long, um, long history in writing and in um, activating the Women in Development in Europe group, and you've just written a book on body politics, uh, your fifth book, and we're very much looking forward to your reaction to your lecture, and then we'll try and um, have a very lively discussion in the last um, 45 minutes. So thank you, Wendy. Wendy Harcourt. Okay, well, well, I would like to join Marisa Menem by thanking um, SID and the others who are organizing this uh, session for inviting me over. It's a great pleasure to be having the opportunity to um, dialogue with uh, Marie Simonen um, and also with all of you. I, I hope that we actually, this is my presentation is, maybe you could help me out there, <laughs> is, is really a, a start of a dialogue. Um, and I'm taking up the opportunity really to um, introduce some of the ideas that I, I've spoken about in, in this book, which is really based on 20 years of dialogue with organizations like UNFPA. I've been very privileged to also be here at the Institute of Social Studies at different times, and some of you in the audience, I've been dialoguing for quite some time about where really the, where is the Cairo agenda? Um, and the vision that Marie Semenen set out, and where is it 15 years later? Um, I want to say, first of all, that I'm very positive about the Cairo agenda, but as it's my role to respond and to be provocative, I'm going to try and raise some issues which I still see as problematic or challenging. Um, I think Marie Simon has really covered very well some of the key um, issues that I, I'm not going to uh, go back to, but I'd like to pick up some things that I do find challenging. Um, so let's say I'm highly sympathetic to Cairo and particularly to UNFPA, and I would say if you read my book, you, you would see that um, SID has had some very important leaders also, uh, including Nafis Sadiq, who was leading Cairo um, as a position as executive director. So I've had the privilege of, of listening and understanding how complex it is to have got the Cairo agenda where it is. And I certainly agree that, and Marie said it very well, that I think it was a complex agenda that was put together because uh, of the openness to bringing in civil society and particularly women's movements. Nevertheless, I think there are some challenges. And I think if we are reflecting right now, 15 years later, in this particular political and particularly this particular uh, economic climate, I think we really have to think about what really counts as progress and who's counting it and you know, where are we really going to stand um, in that context. Um, so if I could just move to the next slide. Um, first of all, I want to say what I see as successful of Cairo. It's a little bit different from the way Marie uh, approached it. And also what I found disappointing about it. That's my prov provocation. And I'm going to do that particularly because I want to say where I think things went a bit wrong with it but in relation to the Millennium Development Goals. And this is where I think I do become provocative. Um, and then I'm going to push a lot harder than Marie did just at the end there, mentioned, you know, it's all of us together. But I'm going to say where are the men in this debate? And I'm quite concerned, and I, listening to Marie, I think I'm right. We're still talking very much about women and women's bodies and women's rights and women's choices, but it's, it's a much more complex picture than that. I'd like to know where the male bodies are in all of this, and there are other, other bodies as well. There's not just male and female bodies, but maybe that gets too provocative. Um, but anyway, these are my three main responses that I'd like to, to raise. Okay, so... What's the success of Cairo? This is me talking. I'm somebody who was at Cairo on the other side of the fence as one of the advocates, one of the people that's running around trying to get uh, keep in the things that you want to keep in. And I think, in fact, Cairo, and then moving on to, to Beijing, uh, to the conference on women, and then probably before Vienna on human rights, it was a really important moment that mobilized many thousands of women's health and rights movements. And it was a very fascinating political process that was about advocacy. It wasn't only about the, the heads of those 179 um, governments. It was really about negotiations well into the night. And those of you who, who understand politics know that that was a very tough thing to, to do. Um, particularly, I would say, um, 